Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's try that one more time. Praise the Lord, everybody. All right. Sounding good this morning. (laughs) Beautiful, sunshiny, cool, crisp morning. Where would you rather be than the house of the Lord? On a Sunday morning, I don't know about you guys, but I find strength for the week when we come to the house of the Lord and we gather together. Besides that, Brother Rich, I think I'd lose track of all the days of the week if we didn't weren't in church on Sunday and Wednesday night. I marked my week. I think, yeah, yesterday we were in church. This has got to be Monday. <laughs> or it's got to be Thursday. <laughs> Good to see all of you this morning. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Good to be into a brand new beginning. I know last Sunday was the first, but... We're still at the beginning of the year and looking forward to what God can and will do for us in 2023 if we'll just trust Him, have faith in Him, and believe in Him. How many of you believe that? So with the Lord's help and with your help, we're going to jump right into our lesson text this morning. How many of you are going to help me today? I'm going to be studying about the 12 spies Study, uh, a story that we're all very familiar with from our childhood up, and we're gonna we're gonna see if the Lord will talk to our hearts just a little bit. I believe there's something to be gleaned and learned from every story in the Bible that we can apply to our lives. Every one of them. Either we can see what they did, Brother Jack, that worked for them, or we can see what they did that was a failure. And try to correct it in in our lives. So we're going to begin reading Numbers chapter 13. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. And then we're going to jump down to verse 17 and begin again. Numbers 13 and 1 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All those men were heads of the children of Israel. Jumping to verse 17. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, Get you up this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwell up therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many and what the land is that they dwell in whether it be good or bad and what cities they be that they dwell in whether in tents or in strongholds and what the land is whether it be fat or lean whether it be wood therein or not and be of good courage and bring of the fruit of the land now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes Moses sent them out on a reconnaissance mission brother Bauer you want to find out what things are made of over there. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob, as men come to Hamath. And they ascended by the south and came into Hebron, where Ahiman, Shishai, and Talma, the children of Anak, were. We're talking about children of the giants. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zon. In Egypt, and they came into the brook of Eshcol and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bare it between two upon a staff. And they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. The place was called the brook Eshcol because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they returned from searching of the land after forty days, and they went and came to Moses and to Aaron, and to all the congregation of the children of Israel, and to the wilderness of Paran, to Kadesh, and brought back word unto them, and unto all the congregation, and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, and said, We came into the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, used to be one of Brother Lonnie's favorite words. Remember that, Brother Jack? Nevertheless, The people be strong that dwell in the land. 
and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there, children of the giant. Now they're having second thoughts. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb still the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched into the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. They never entered God into the equation. It was just what are we able to do? What can we do? On, on our own, we can't deal with them. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord, we love you and we appreciate you. We ask you, Jesus, to talk to our hearts this morning. Speak to us, Lord. Give us all something that we can take home with us that will encourage us, that will help us through this week. Lord, I need you, Jesus. This morning, I need you every day. And we just ask you to walk the aisles of this sanctuary today and talk to our hearts and strengthen and help us to live for you. And we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. How many of us have ever dealt with fear in our lives? I think every one of us at some point have had fear. The heat of the July sun beat mercilessly on her back as she stood trembling at the edge of the swimming pool. Her toes functioned more like fingers as they gripped the rounded edge of the concrete. A voice from the pool beckoned again, jump! Fear gripped little Emily's pounding heart as possibility was held captive by the uncertainty. She could clearly see the swimming pool was a place for fun and refreshment, but she could also see the danger of the depths of the billowing water that awaited her. I can't, she shrieked. I'll catch you, assured her father. In that moment, her mind was flooded with what ifs. Any of us ever thought, what if? What if he drops me? What if he makes me try to swim on my own? What if I try to swim and I sink? Please, Daddy, don't make me, she begged. With calm assurance, her dad promised he would not drop her. He promised to teach her how to swim. He assured her she would be so glad she took the leap. The cool, refreshing waters were far better than the scorching sun radiating down on her fair skin. Cautiously, she leaned forward as her arms reached for her daddy. Courage swelled as her tiny heart pounded rapidly. rapidly. In an instant, trust overcame her fear, and she took her father at his word, and she jumped in. Splash. Fear is a powerful emotion. It has crippled the mighty and limited the capable. It is mighty enough to keep us from achieving our goals and living our best. It feeds stagnation and keeps us from taking advantage of opportunities. Many people are living in the self-made prison of their own fears. However, a life lived by overcoming fear is not only something we all deserve, but it is something for which God commanded us to strive. That means it is completely possible without covering, overcoming our fears, we can never experience some of God's greatest promises. We do not want to simply tolerate our fears. We must eliminate them. And every one of us could say amen. amen. We need to eliminate them. Is it easy? No. Do we have a brand new fear show up every day? Yes. But more than that, is God with us every day? And the answer is a resounding yes. As we lay the foundation for today's lesson, think back about the dramatic story of Moses leading the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage and miraculously crossing the Red Sea with walls of water 
standing on both sides of them. That's an image that is in our mind even from a childhood Sunday school class lesson. Many of you have seen the picture of the Israelites walking across, being led by, by Moses and Aaron and the walls of water stacked up on both sides. And then, Sister Rich, not only did they get across, when they got across and the enemy was chasing them, what happened? God covered them up and ended. That was the end of that. The end of that problem, Brother Rich, with the Egyptians that they dealt with for hundreds of years. Now fast forward just a short period of time after they witnessed this and they were singing and worshiping and praising and singing songs of the great mighty power of God and what he'd done for them and just a short time later they were getting ready to go in and possess the land. Twelve men were eagerly assembled, representing the twelve tribes of a great nation God had promised Abraham. And all this, you've got to think, these great victories are still sitting right here in the back of our mind, in their mind. So they're going to go in, they're going to check things out over there, and they're going to come back with a report. God wanted to show his people the blessings that awaited them. How many of you believe blessings await God's people? If we just receive them, if we just wake up of a morning and say, Lord, I don't know what today holds, but I know who holds today, and I know who holds tomorrow, and I know that you're with me, you love me, you've taken care of me this far, and I believe you're going to continue, and his blessings are there waiting on us. Hundreds of years earlier, God had challenged Abraham to trust him, forsake the comforts of his homeland and family, and set out for a land that God would show him. How much faith did that take? How many of you like to leave home at, at, at some of our ages? We don't want to get too far. <laughs> Brother Rich, we want to be able to know we can get back pretty quick if we need to. There's something about home. There's a security about when you go in at night, you close the door, maybe you kick the fireplace on, and in my case, my, my lovely wife's got something going to, to eat. There's, there's peace and there's comfort and there's joy in that. I've told her lots of times, I said, after the battles of a day that we endure in life, we need to come home to a peaceful, loving home at night. It's a place of security. But nonetheless, God told him, he said, if you'll go, I'll make a great nation out of you. God desired the 12 spies from these tribes to finally witness and report on the promised blessings. This is something that the Lord had promised hundreds of years earlier and they're right there at the brink. They're at the door, knocking on the door to go over and take it. Before they left on their journey, Israel's 12 spies were commissioned to be of good courage. What they witnessed on their 40-day journey was amazing. All you have to do is just read about it. The land they saw was everything that God had promised. Would we expect anything less? If God makes us a promise, it's not going to be something that when we get there, it's going to be less than the best. It's not going to be something that's going to be less than what he promised. It's going to be as good or better. Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has gone to prepare for us. But we're in this journey right now, church. We're, we're walking. Just as these children of Israel were walking, we're in this journey now. Amen. They brought back a testimony of a land that flowed with milk and honey. They came with grapes, figs, and pomegranates. The clusters of grapes were so big it took two men to carry them on a pole. Brother Jack, that's what you call a bumper crop. They had those grapes laying down that pole and a man on this end and a man on that end and they was bringing them back. That's the land that the Lord had prepared for them. The 12 spies truly had found the promised land. 
There's that word, auntie. B-U-T. But. But their hopes were drowning in the sea of fear and unbelief. How many of us have ever let that happen to us? I won't ask for a show of hands. But we, we probably all have at some point. They were blinded by the challenges rather than motivated by the promises. Life has some challenges along the way, doesn't it? Like every day when we get out of bed. <clears throat> I saw a deal on my phone the other day that said, morning begins after coffee. And maybe some of you, now my wife could jump out of bed and literally in 30 seconds to a minute, if she chooses, she can be doing her two-mile walk. Honey, I'm not going to do a two-mile walk 30 seconds after I'm still trying to rub my eyes and figure out what's going to happen today. Now, I'll get going in a little bit, but not that quick. I had to get my blood pumping a little bit and get a cup of coffee and make a few phone calls, and then I'm ready to venture out, Brother Jack, and get going. But i got to think about it just a few minutes. But my little wife... She's wired to go, and she, it doesn't bother her in the least to jump right out of that bed. i got to be at town in a little bit, but I'm going to get my two miles in real quick. And off she goes, like an energizer bunny. We're all made a little different, every one of us. But ten out of the twelve were ready to give up. They were ready to throw in the towel. We talked about that Wednesday night in our discussion that, that such a powerful... If you, if you weren't here Wednesday night, you missed it. Powerful, powerful, powerful move of God. And you say, well, that's just a little Bible study and have a snack and go home. It wasn't that night, Sister Bauer. God knows when we need something. He knows what we need and he knows how to provide it. And he was here in a special and a powerful way on Wednesday night. So the 10 out of the 12 said, there's giants in that land. There's no way. There's no way we can go in and possess it. However, there were two men that had a different report. And the lesson brought out, and I, I didn't go through all of the names of the ten that had a negative report. Never really heard of them, to be honest with you. Why hadn't we heard of them? Why had we heard of Joshua and Caleb? with a positive report. Could it be that God takes positive reports and he does things through those people and he multiplies through them and he does great works through them and if we have a negative, negative report all the time, how's God going to use us if we don't believe? How is he going to build a church and he can do anything he wants to but he does it through people that believe and trust in him and reach out to him and ask him. We can't do it, but he can. But Brother Bauer, he's expecting us to be a willing vessel. He's expecting us to, to do a work for him, to tell others about him. We're his hands, we're his feet, we're his voice to the world in this world that we live in now. Joshua and Caleb declared that Israel is fully capable to take the land that God promised. And they said, we need to go up at once and do it. <clears throat> they had the same mindset that Paul spoke of in Romans 8 and 31 when he said, if God be for us, who can be against us? There can be a lot of people against us, but if God's for us, he's going to make a way. How many of you believe that today? With all of my heart, if God's for us, I believe we're going to win. Yes. Faith will always prompt action. Doubt cripples. Amen? Amen. Faith mobilizes. Amen? Amen? Fear paralyzes. We've heard the phrase paralyzed by fear. Where you just lock up and you don't feel like you can go to the right, you can't go to the left, you can't go forward, you can't back up. You just lock up because we're scared to death of what's going to happen next. Faith marches forward, but fear causes us to retreat. The choice is ours. Do we choose to trust in the Lord? Do we choose to believe in Him and believe what His Word says? Or do we say, well, I know he can, but I just don't know if he will. If 
he said it, he will. All he wants us to do is trust and believe and keep on walking. A trip that should have taken 11 days lasted 40 years. And I'm closing. 40 long years wandering around out there. So a young man that was 15 years old wandering, uh, that was getting, when they were getting ready to go in, he wandered around, Brother Rich, till he was 55 years old. Nearly as old as, as my wife and I, not quite, but almost. Time wasted. Days, months, and years lost and wasted because of unbelief. They wandered 40 years in the wilderness. Let's always remember if God has made us a promise, he will deliver it to us. All we have to do is believe. But he expects us to keep on keeping on. He expects us to trust him. Are there times when it's difficult? Absolutely. Make no bones about it. There's times when life is just flat out tough and difficult. And we don't know what to do. But God told us if we do what he said to do, we're going to inherit a place that's our promised land. Eye hasn't seen and ear hasn't heard, as we mentioned a moment ago, what he's gone to prepare for those of us that try our best to try to live for him. Can we make it on our own? I can't. Can't even start. But the best part of the whole story is we're not on our own. We're, we're, we have our hand in his hand and like the story said, when there were only one set of footprints, Brother Jack, that's when he was carrying us. It wasn't that he had left us and we were still trudging on our, on our own. He was carrying us, and those footprints were his, carrying us because he knew we were weak and he knew we were, we were subject to failure, and he picked us up and carried us on. And I'll leave you with this. On September 17, 1935, at 10 a.m., a child was stillborn. After being revived, he was rushed to the hospital with severe brain damage. The doctor's prognosis was not hopeful, and he predicted the child would not survive 24 hours. The doctor advised the family to pray for the child to experience a merciful death because he would never walk, and he would never talk, or see if he somehow survived. The odds were stacked against him. The child survived but faced daunting odds. The story of his life is riveting. He was always seemingly a step behind. While other children were learning to walk, he was learning to crawl. While others were running, he was stumbling. His parents spent countless hours working with him, determined to give him as normal of a life as possible. After his first day of riding a bike, and this is going to tell us a little bit right here about his personality. After his first day of riding a bike, he was scraped, he was bruised, he was black and blue, and green sounds kind of like me probably when I was trying to learn. And I didn't have all of them, all of those problems. I've, I've probably got some, but maybe not all that many. <laughs> he leaned the bike up and he declared, you had your day, tomorrow's mine. Does that tell you anything about him? I'll break you tomorrow. I'll ride you. <laughs> If I die, right before I die, I'm going to ride you. My dad used to say it like this, son, you gotta get a bulldog hold and you gotta hang on no matter what comes. Hang on like a bulldog. Here's the interesting part. You know who it was? His name was Alan C. Oggs Sr. And it almost brings tears to my eyes because my wife and I were here when he came here and preached. Brother Jack, were you here? 
Let me go a little farther, and you'll, you'll remember it if you were. And he did learn to ride that bike. In spite of limited physical abilities, he went on to marry, have children, and become a successful evangelist in the United Pentecostal Church International. He chronicled his life story in his inspirational autobiography, You've Got to Have the Want To. What many would have seen as a life of obstacles and roadblocks, Brother Og saw as challenges to overcome. He often used his disabilities and challenges to his advantage. He traveled the world preaching and challenging people to be overcomers. He compared his physical challenges and mindset of overcoming them <clears throat> to how all of us must tackle life's obstacles. He declared his life's motto, you got to have the want to. Whatever we face in our lives, we must never forget the promises and possibilities we have in Christ. It does not matter what obstacles life or the devil throws our way, we must strive to see through God's eyes. We must believe what God has promised is possible through his strength. God's power coupled with our want to can usher us into a life pursuit where we claim the amazing promises in God's word. He's gone to prepare a place for us, church, and he's made a way for us to get there. We just got to have the want to. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. of 